And if so, how should we expound it today in face of a perplexing variety of views that are put forward concerning the person and work of Jesus Christ? We've been thinking in our first three lectures about the person of the Savior, but tonight we are going to think about his atoning work. And I take as title for the lecture that phrase, a wonderful exchange, I take it directly from Martin Luther. It seems to me that it's a superb phrase, in fact, to describe what we are talking about what Paul was concerned to teach us about when he spoke of Christ crucified. Here is a quote from Luther which shows you how he used the phrase. This is that mystery which is rich in divine grace to sinners, writes Luther, wherein, by a wonderful exchange, our sins are no longer ours but Christ's. And the righteousness of Christ's is not Christ's, but ours. He has emptied himself of his righteousness that he might clothe us with it and fill us with it. And he has taken our evils upon himself that he might deliver us from them. In the same manner as he grieved and suffered in our sins and was confounded, in the same manner we rejoice and glory in his righteousness. Let's have a little more from Luther as he explains, first, what he conceives happened to Jesus Christ. Here he is expounding Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. This is the first stage in the wonderful exchange as Luther understood the matter, I quote him again. All the prophets did foresee in spirit that Christ should become the greatest transgressor, murderer, adulterer, thief, rebel, blasphemer, etc., that ever was. For he being made a sacrifice for the sins of the whole world is not now an innocent person and without sins. Our most merciful father sent his only son into the world and laid upon him the sins of all men, saying, Be thou Peter, that denier, Paul, that persecutor, blasphemer, and cruel oppressor, David, that adulterer, that sinner which did eat the apple in paradise, that thief which hanged upon the cross, and briefly, be thou the person who has committed the sins of all men. See therefore that thou pay and satisfy for them. Here now comes the law and says, I find him a sinner, therefore let him die upon the cross. And so it sets upon him and kills him. By this means is the whole world cleansed from sin and all unrighteousness. Well, that's exuberant talk, but you can see what Luther means. Luther is expounding what we call substitution, Christ in our place. Calvin, in soberer and more guarded language, made the same point when in his institutes he expounded those words of the creed crucified under Pontius Pilate. Here he is commenting on Jesus' trial before Pilate. Quote Calvin, When Jesus was arraigned before a judgment seat, accused and put under pressure by testimony, and sentenced to death by the words of a judge. We know by these records, that is, by the record of these things, that he played the role, or fulfilled the role, of a guilty wrongdoer. We see the role of sinner and criminal represented in Christ. And yet, from his shining innocence, it becomes obvious that he was burdened with the misdoing of others rather than his own. This is our acquittal, that the guilt which exposed us to punishment was transferred to the head of God's Son. And again he says, at every point he substituted himself in our place to pay the price of our redemption. 
And now here is Luther again, speaking of the second stage in the wonderful exchange. He is writing a pastoral letter to a friend of his, Georg Spenlein, who was in trouble of spirit, had written Luther a very sad letter expressing his sense of grief and distress and alarm because of his own continued, sin, sin, his own continued sinfulness. Luther wrote back to him in these terms. Quote Luther, Learn Christ and him crucified. Learn to pray to him and despairing of yourself say, Thou, Lord Jesus, art my righteousness, and I am thy sin. Thou hast taken upon thyself what is mine, and hast given to me what is thine. Thou hast taken upon thyself what thou wast not, and hast given to me what I was not. And that, according to Luther, is the wonderful exchange. Our sins upon him, and his righteousness upon us. And you can see what Luther is doing here. Luther is developing and expounding and elaborating the thought which Paul first spelled out at the end of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, says Paul. Question, how was he doing that? Answer, next phrase, not imputing, not counting men's trespasses against them. God in Christ was reconciling the world to himself by not counting men's trespasses against them. How did God do that? How was God able to do that? Verse 21. For our sake, he, God the Father, made him, Jesus Christ, God the Son, he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Some commentators expound the phrase, made him to be sin, as meaning made him to be a sin offering. And that certainly is part of the truth, and grammatically is a perfectly possible view of the whole meaning of the phrase. But the flow of thought in the context makes me think that in fact it's not the whole meaning of the phrase. We have just heard that God in Christ reconciled the world to himself by not imputing men's trespasses to them. I conceive that Paul is here explaining how that was, and that when he says that the Father made the Son to be sin, him who knew no sin, that is, him who was sinless in his own personal experience, what he's talking about is the Son of God being made sin by imputation of our sins to him. And I conceive that the flow of thought to the second half of the verse confirms that. For, God goes on, for Paul goes on to say, God did this so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And here, as several times in Paul's writings, he puts an abstract noun where you would have expected an adjective. He says, we might become the righteousness of God, where you might have expected him to say, we might become righteous before God. And it seems to me that the natural way to read Paul's words is precisely in terms of the thought of the wonderful exchange that Luther has drawn out. God made him to be sin by imputing our sins to him, that in him, in union with him, we might become the righteousness of God that is, might become righteous in God's sight through righteousness being imputed, reckoned to us. In other words, I read these words just as Luther did 
And just as Richard Hooker, that classical Anglican divine, did, when at the end of his learned sermon on justification, he declared in a wonderful perorative sentence, let men count it folly or frenzy or whatsoever, we care for no wisdom, no knowledge in the world but this, that man has sinned and God has suffered, that God is made the sin of man and men are made the righteousness of God. This, I conceive, is what Paul meant when he spoke of Christ crucified. This, I conceive, is how Paul understood the mediation of the Lord Jesus, that ministry which he fulfilled as the middleman, standing between God, the righteous judge, and man, the ruined sinner, and bringing the two together, taking out of the way the obstacles which kept them apart. Those obstacles are our sins, or the obstacle, shall I say, is the guilt of our sins, and he took it out of the way. And so reconciliation was accomplished, and God and man were brought together. I read my New Testament, and I find that the cross is its centerpiece, first to last. And I find that the Declaration of Paul in Galatians 6, verse 14, God forbid that I should glory, boast, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, is in fact an expression of the temper of the whole New Testament. For explaining the cross, the New Testament uses many images, many categories, many modes of thought, Blended together, these various categories and modes of thought serve to enrich our understanding of the cross and its meaning. It's represented, for instance, as sacrifice, as we're going to see more fully in a moment. Whenever we hear of the blood of Christ or the blood of his cross, sacrificial ideas are being invoked. Similarly, the cross is represented as a ransom. Not only a sacrifice for sins, but a purchase delivering us from captivity and jeopardy as the payment of a ransom does. Again, the cross is represented in the New Testament as victory, triumph over the devil and demonic forces. Hebrews 2.14 and following, by death Christ, de de Christ destroyed him who has the power of death, that is, broke his power, in order to deliver those who all their lifetime were subject to bondage. And Colossians 2 verse 15 declares that to the eye of faith, at least it's plain, that Christ on the cross triumphed over demonic hosts and led them in his train as their conqueror. Whatever the world sees when it looks at the cross, that is what the eye of faith sees. Christ sloughed off the forces of evil, triumphing over them on the cross. There's the thought of victory. Again, the cross of Christ is represented in the New Testament in terms of redemption, a price paid for the freedom of a slave. And we've already noted Paul using the category of reconciliation, the word that speaks of the mending of a broken relationship and the establishing of peace where previously there was alienation. And there is also in the New Testament that term propitiation, which the Revised Standard Version translates expiation, presumably under the influence of Professor C.H. Dodd, who argued very influentially from 1930 onward that 
This word, hilasterion in the Greek and hilasmos, this word signifies only the putting away of sin from God's sight, but not the quenching of his wrath, because, said Professor Dodd, there is no personal wrath of God against sinners to be reckoned with. Uh, suffice it to say that I believe Professor Dodd misconstrued the New Testament at that point, and I take propitiation in the sense which really belief in the wrath of God compels one to take Propitiation, according to, the according to the background of usage in secular Greek and also in the Greek Old Testament, signifies the putting away of the wrath of God by removal of that which evokes it. And that, I believe, is precisely what it means to say that the cross of Christ was a propitiation for our sins that which provoked God's personal judicial hostility to us sinners was put away, namely the guilt of our sin. So propitiation is a word expressing the complex idea of the quenching of God's wrath by the removal of that which evokes it, namely by, thus by the putting away of our sins. And this is part of the glory of the cross. So I conceive, as I read my New Testament, that it does this. In all these terms, the cross is presented to us by these New Testament writers. And reading these passages, as I do, I find myself constrained to affirm what the mainstream of Protestant theology has affirmed for four centuries and more, namely that the basic notion, the fundamental notion underlying all the other notions that concern the achievement of the cross is the notion of substitution, substitution under judgment, substitution whereby the Son of God, who for us men and for our salvation had become man, endured the sentence which a holy God had declared against our sins in order that the guilty, you and I, the offenders, might go free, our sins being forgiven, and our relationship with God being put right, which is what that phrase, righteous before God, or the righteousness of God, means. I don't find myself able to doubt that the notion of penal substitution or penal satisfaction, as it used to be expressed, is in fact the heart of the New Testament message of the cross. Let me say a word about that term satisfaction. It's a word which has been used in Christian atonement theology from very early days. It first came into theology from Roman law. It signified that which is done in order to cancel out a legal obligation. Anselm, one of the pioneer Christian theologians of the atonement in the 11th century AD, construed the notion of Christ's death as a satisfaction for sin in terms of what nowadays we would call damages, compensation. An offering made to God to satisfy his honor, his dignity, which our sins had outraged. Luther, more scripturally, expounded satisfaction in terms not of compensation for sin, but rather in terms of penal substitution, Christ passing under judgment for our sins. And this, I conceive, is exactly what the New Testament is talking about. And this, of course, is what our prayer book is talking about when in the 1662 
communion service. It, taught, it, uh, it, it, it teaches us to pray. It, it teaches us to give thanks to God for his tender love towards mankind, which prompted him to give his son, who by his one oblation of himself once offered, made a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for our sins. That's the same language as the Heidelberg Catechism had used at the end of the 16th century when it taught the Christian to declare, my only comfort in life and death is that I belong unto my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood has fully satisfied for all my sins. Satisfaction is the old word, and I conceive it was a good one. It expresses the thought that Christ did all that needed to be done in order that our sins might be put away from God's sight. But you don't need me to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sure, that very many in our day have challenged the scripturalness of this understanding of things and urged, by the aid of exegesis as well as more general theological reasoning, that in saying these things, we are misinterpreting the New Testament witness. Therefore, I want to devote the thrust of my lecture this evening to vindicating the account of the matter that I've just given you against its critics. Is this view, penal substitution, as I've called it, penal satisfaction, the old name, is this view scriptural or is it not? That's the question. Let me introduce my response to the suspicion that it isn't like this. In Paul, who is the most elaborate expositor of the atonement in the New Testament, one discerns, as one reads him, a certain hierarchy of concepts. He sees the cross, the crucifixion of Jesus Christ in which he glories, as achieving redemption, that is, deliverance from evil, deliverance from bondage, because it achieves justification, bringing forgiveness and a righteous standing with God, as achieving justification, or, oh, sorry, let me put, phrase that differently, it achieves justification because it achieves reconciliation, it makes peace between ourselves and God. It achieves reconciliation by being an act of propitiation, quenching God's wrath by putting away sins. And it achieves propitiation just as it achieves redemption and reconciliation and justification by being an act of blood shedding, that is, an act of sacrifice. Paul speaks of our having redemption through Jesus' blood in Ephesians 1.7. He speaks of our being justified by his blood in Romans 5, verse 9. He speaks of, his have, of Christ's having reconciled us to God by the blood of his, and made peace by the blood of his cross, Colossians 1, verse 20. And he speaks of God as having set the Savior forth as a propitiation by his blood, in Romans 3, verse 25. And that word blood, as we've already said, points to sacrifice, points to those Old Testament rituals in which the blood of animals were shed for the sins of men. What we ask was the meaning of the shedding of blood in sacrifice. This has been much discussed in our day it was fashionable at the beginning of the century to affirm that the meaning of the shedding of blood was not, as Bible students used to think, that hereby life was laid down in death by way of substitutionary offering, but rather that hereby a life force, some kind of 
mana, some kind of uh, energy, was released from the animal in whom it had resided, released for the reinvigorating of the relationship between men and God, which sin had weakened and obstructed. That notion is going out of fashion now, partly as a result of the very brilliant work on this subject of Dr. Leon Morris of Melbourne. But really, it's hard to read the Bible sympathetically and not feel, not indeed be constrained to judge that the meaning of the shedding of blood is most certainly that hereby life is laid down in death as a substitutionary offering to atone for sin. In Leviticus chapter 17 and verse 11, we find God saying through Moses concerning the sacrificial rituals of the Old Testament, the life of the flesh is in the blood and I have given it for you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by reason of the life. That, of course, could be taken as signifying that the blood makes atonement by reason of the relief, release of vital energy to restore the relationship, though I don't think that that's a natural view, nor is it suggested by the context. But it becomes an extremely unnatural view, I think, when one links this Leviticus passage up with something in Numbers, chapter 35, verses 31 to 34. Here, God, through Moses, is laying down rules about the cities of refuge. And it says, or God says, You shall accept no ransom for the life of a murderer who is guilty of death, but he shall be put to death. And you shall accept no ransom for him who has fled to his city of refuge, that he may return to dwell in the land before the death of the high priest. You shall not thus pollute the land in which you live, for blood, blood shed, he means, the blood of murder, pollutes the land, and no pollution can be made for the land, for the blood that is shed in it, except by the blood of him who shed it. Pollution is only done away. That which hinders communion between God and his people in the land is only removed by the shedding of the blood of the murderer, unless indeed the murderer remains and throughout, the, throughout the life of the high priest in his city of refuge, which is the exception that God made. But otherwise, the only way in which the pollution brought on the land by the shedding of blood in murder can be removed is by the shedding of the blood of the murderer. That looks like retribution, doesn't it? That looks like the doing of justice by which God is satisfied. That doesn't leave us, or that doesn't take us at all into the world of thought in which life is released for the renewing or revitalizing of a relationship. No, pollution is removed. And that, it seems, is the, sp the sphere of thought in which Leviticus 17, verse 11, also moves. And when one looks at the sacrificial rituals, this impression is strongly confirmed. Take the regular trespass offering. How was it made? By the worshiper drawing near, that's the phrase that, that's used, it refers to his coming to the sanctuary, drawing near with a perfect victim, a faultless animal, he places his hand on the head of the animal and kills it there at the sanctuary. Then the priest drains out the blood and pours the blood on one of the altars in the sanctuary. The significance of that action, surely, is as a witness to God, as a token, a testimony, a demonstration that life has been taken according to God's ordinance, to atone and make satisfaction for the sin that was done. 
Or look at the ritual of the Day of Atonement, of which the writer to the Hebrews in his ninth chapter makes so much. We, when we give our Sunday school addresses on the Day of Atonement, always, for some reason, train our spotlight on the scapegoat. Uh, the scapegoat, one of the two animals that's taken his, uh, over the scapegoat, the sins of the people are confessed, and then the scapegoat is driven outside the camp bearing the sins of Israel, bearing the sins of the people away. Yes, but what we should remember is that what was done with a scapegoat was only part of the ritual. There were two goats, not just one. And the second goat was killed in the sanctuary. And as the writer to the Hebrews reminds us, that was the one occasion each, when each year the high priest would go to the wilderness was itself a divinely given illustration and exhibition for the people to see and to learn from of what was actually being accomplished by the death of the other goat. It was the blood shedding on the Day of Atonement, which, according to God's ordinance, was the guarantee of his forgiveness of the people's sins during that past year. And we know from New Testament theology that these sacrifices had their efficacy through the blood of Christ which was to be shed but which covered sins committed before Christ came just as it covers sins committed since Christ came. But that's not the point on which I'm focusing now. The point on which I'm focusing is that God associated the forgiveness of sins with the shedding of blood the pouring out of life in death. And so in that great prophetic passage in which the servant of God is pictured as being made an offering for sin. He's stricken, he's killed, he's put to death for the sins of God's people. And thus says the writer, Isaiah 53 and verse 10, God fulfills his pleasure to make the servant's soul an offering for sin. What we are seeing here, surely, can only naturally be interpreted in terms of substitution. And when we read Paul spelling out to us the meaning of the cross of Christ in salvation terms, surely all doubt is finally vanished, banished. I'm sorry. Look again at Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. What is the flow of thought in Paul's, own, in, Paul's own, in, in Paul's own sentence? Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Question, how? Answer, being made a curse for us. The, particip the, the, um, the participial phrase, I'm sorry, the participial phrase is answering the question, how? It's explanatory of the method. It's affirming substitutionary suffering. We've looked at 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21. God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. A sin offering? Yes, for sure. Because, as I've already urged, we are to understand from the flow of thought in the context that our sins had been imputed to the Son of God and he died thus as our victim, the innocent suffering for the guilty. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14, Paul explains the cross in these terms. Uh, let me pick up in verse 13 where the sentence begins and then we'll get the flow of thought. God made you alive together with Christ, you who were dead in trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, having forgiven us all our trespasses, having canceled the bond which stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, 
nailing it to the cross. The bond, which stood against us with its legal demands, is quite certainly the law of God with its requirement of total righteousness, the law of God here viewed as, so to speak, an IOU, a statement of what we owe God. We have not rendered the righteousness which we were obliged to render. We have broken the law. We have transgressed. Consequently, the IOU becomes our death warrant. We come under the penal sanctions of the law because we've broken it. But, says Paul, God cancelled this bond and set it aside. How did he do that? By nailing it to Christ's cross. Surely we are to understand this in terms of the detail which all the evangelists record that, as was usual at a Roman execution, the accusation, that is, the statement of the crime for which the person was being executed, was nailed up on the cross so that everyone might see what it was that this person was being executed for. And we know that uh, with the eye of flesh, what those who stood by the cross saw nailed up on it as the accusation against Jesus, the crime of which he'd been found guilty, was Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. He claimed to be the King of the Jews he was executed for that claim. That's what the eye of flesh was shown by the accusation that Pilate had nailed up. But, says Paul, the eye of faith sees beyond this. The eye of faith sees nailed to Christ's cross, indicating that for which he's being put to death. The whole tally of our disobediences the whole sad story of the points at which we fail to keep God's law. It's the same story that Paul is telling. It's the same point that he's making. Penal substitution is the phrase that we need. Penal substitution is what's being spoken about. And finally, link with these passages from Paul, the words in Romans chapter 3, verses 25 and 26 where Paul, having told us in a very compressed, weighty passage that God put forward his own son to be a propitiation by his blood, he continues, I read my Revised Standard Version, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to prove at the present time that he himself is righteous and that he justifies him who has faith in Jesus. Now these verses have been much fought over by the exegetes. Time doesn't allow me to discuss tonight, although I promise you to discuss in the printed version of the lectures the reasons why I take as preferable the view of the passage which I'm going to set before you now. We haven't time to consider alternatives. I simply see these verses in the flow of thought in Romans, and judge, therefore, that the only natural way to take them is this. God set forth Christ as a propitiation by his blood to show his righteousness. What righteousness is this? It's the righteousness that Paul has been talking about in the previous chapter. The righteousness of God who is going to show his hand in righteous judgment. Chapter 2, verse 6 of Romans speaks of the day of wrath and demonstration of the righteous judgment of God. It's judicial righteousness that's in view here. God's judicial righteousness had a question mark against it because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. What are they? They are the sins which he did, in fact, forgive under the Old Testament when men offered the prescribed sacrifices. In the nature of the case, it's not plain that the blood of an animal can put away the sin of a man. Iniquity, in strict justice, 
it appears that God forgave sins without an adequate compensation or without an adequate offering. So there's a question mark against God's justice. Is he really going to judge sin? Is he really the God whose nature it is to judge every sin as it deserves? Yes, says Paul, now that we can look at the cross of Christ, we can see that it is so. Christ died as the substitute for every sinner who has transgressed and whose sins are now forgiven, and as a substitute for every sinner who will transgress and whose sins will be forgiven. It was to show at his present time, says Paul, that God himself is righteous in judging sin, that he does in fact inflict the full penalty wherever sin has been committed, but not on the sinner, rather on the sinner's substitute. He himself is righteous in judging sin and, at the same time, by the means of his judging sin, the particular way that he does it, that he's, it's to show that he also justifies him who has faith in Jesus. Just justification. Justification, that is, pardon and acceptance, based upon the judgment of our sins in the person of another, is the message which Paul is teaching here, so I conceive, in Romans 3 and on through Romans 4 and 5. Thus I read Paul as he explains the meaning of the cross of Christ. And on these biblical grounds, I maintain that penal substitution is the, indeed the phrase that we need in order to express the truth about Christ's cross. But there are objections, and there are problems, and there are difficulties raised, and our argument is not yet done, we must look at some of these problems and we must make some further points in order to vindicate belief in penal substitution against the criticisms that are brought. So, let me now branch out what I've said into five further points, which from one standpoint are no more than a spelling out of the implications of what I've said already, but from another standpoint, are important specifications of what's being said in order to answer critics. First point, um, a verbal one, a pipe opener, we might say. The prejudice against the word substitution is misplaced. We find ourselves confronted with a whole host of writers who tell us the word substitution does not fit. What one should say about the cross of Christ is that it was vicarious and representative, but not substitutionary. I think it's sufficient to answer that point from the dictionary. I open my Oxford English Dictionary, and I find that substitution is defined as, I quote, the putting of one person or thing in the place of another, I find then that when I look up representation, it's defined as the fact of standing for or in place of some other thing or person, substitution of one thing or person for another. And I find that the word vicarious is defined as, quote, that which takes or supplies the place of another thing or person, substituted instead of the proper thing or person. And on the basis of the Oxford English Dictionary, I say, here is a distinction without a difference. The words representative and vicarious mean substitutionary. And we might just as well call a spade a spade and use this clear and basic word. Second point that I want to make, the sphere of substitution is judicial. I wish to argue against those who say, and some do, that we could conceive of a substitution which was not penal in character, 
but we balk at the idea of substitution under divine judgment, to those folk I want to say, you have to reckon with the sphere of divine judgment as both scripture and our own moral experience introduce us to it. Penal substitution as a notion does that. And that indeed is its glory. Penal substitution is a phrase which, come, which, which echoes the Latin poina, meaning penalty, and refers to the penalty due to us from God the judge for wrong done and failure to meet his claims. This we've said. Now the divine judicial context is a moral context also. God judges according to what is true and right. His judgment is not arbitrary. He judges things as they are. Whereas human ju judicial systems are not always rooted in moral reality, the Bible treats the worlds of moral reality and of divine judgment as coinciding. Divine judgment means that retribution is entailed by our past upon our present and future existence. And God himself is in charge of this process. And he ensures, because it is right that he should ensure, that the objective wrongness and guiltiness of what we've been is always there to touch what we are now and what we are going to be. In the words of Emil Brunner, guilt means that our past, which never be made good, always constitutes one element in our present situation. And surely that is a matter of moral reality and of actual moral experience. Guilt from the past does stretch out its hand to touch and blight our experience in the present. When Lady Macbeth, walking and talking in her sleep, sees blood on her hand and doesn't know how to clean or sweeten that hand, she's witnessing to the order of retribution as all writers of tragedy and surely all reflective men, certainly all reflective men who believe in the judgment of God have come to know it. Wrongdoing may be forgotten for a time, as David forgot his sin over Bathsheba and Uriah, but sooner or later it comes back to mind, as David's sin did under Nathan's ministry, and at once conscience begins to work and our attention is absorbed and our peace and our pleasure are gone, and something tells us that we ought to suffer for the thing that we've done. The old divines urge that when joined with inklings of God's displeasure for what we've done, this sense of things is in truth the start of hell. Hell on earth. Now, it's into this context of the actual experience of guilt and conviction of sin that the truth of penal substitution is introduced in order to focus for us four insights about our situation. And this is the way, so I conceive, that Paul is applying it in those contexts from which I've quoted. But let me summarize the insights in order in human terms like this. Insight one concerns God. And it is that the retributive principle to which our consciences testify when they condemn us, has God's sanction and is indeed an expression of the holiness and justice and goodness that his law reflects. And death, spiritual as well as physical, the loss of the life of God as well as of the life of the body, is the rightful sentence which he's announced against us and now prepares to inflict upon us. Insight number two concerns ourselves. It is that standing in this way under sentence, we are helpless either to undo the past or to shake off sin in the present, and thus we have no way of averting what threatens. Insight three concerns our Lord Jesus Christ. It is that he took our place under divine judgment and received in his own personal experience all the dimensions of the death that was our sentence, whatever these were, so laying the foundation for our pardon and immunity. Luther claimed 
well, I say claimed, I should simply have, have said expounded scripture in these terms. Christ himself suffered the dread and horror of a distressed conscience that tasted eternal wrath. It was not a game or a joke or play acting when he said, thou hast forsaken me. For then he felt himself really forsaken in all things, even as a sinner is forsaken. And we say, do we not? We may not know, we cannot tell what pains he had to bear, but we believe it was for us he hung and suffered there. I say it again, he received in his own personal experience all the dimensions of the death that was our sentence, whatever these were, and so laid the foundation for our pardon and immunity. And the fourth insight, which the notion of penal substitution introduces into our actual experience of guilt and the bad conscience, has to do with faith. It is this, that faith is a matter first and foremost of looking outside and away from oneself to Christ and his cross as the sole ground of present forgiveness and future hope. Faith sees that God's demands remain what they were, and that God's law of retribution, which our consciences declare to be right, has not ceased to operate in his world, nor ever will. But that in our case, the law has operated already, inasmuch as all our sins, past, present, and even future, have been covered by Calvary. So our conscience is pacified by the knowledge that our sins have already been judged and punished in the person and death of another. So Bunyan's pilgrim before the cross loses his burden, and Top Lady can assure himself that, and here I quote a stanza from one of Top Lady's hymns, if thou my pardon hast secured, and freely in my room endured the whole of wrath divine, payment God cannot twice demand, first from my bleeding short his hand, and then again from mine. And reasoning thus, faith grasps the reality of God's free gift of righteousness, the rightness with God that the righteous enjoy, and faith grasps along with this the justified man's obligation to live henceforth unto the one who for his sake died and rose again, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14. This is the sphere of substitution, the penal sphere. This is what substitution means in terms of the actual human problem of actual human guilt. Because the problem of actual human guilt is at the very heart of the human predicament and at the very heart of human misery, I am bold to affirm, as my ancestors in the gospel also affirmed, that penal substitution is in very truth the heart of the gospel, for it speaks directly to the very heart of human need. And here quickly now is a third point. The context of substitution is solidarity. What we have here in this great transaction whereby God in Christ saves us from our sins is not a legal fiction, but rather a, a case of solidarity whereby Christ involves us in his righteousness through union with him as truly as Adam involved us in his sinning through our union with him and his with us. Penal substitution is grounded in this ontological solidarity. It's one moment in the larger mystery of what Luther called the wonderful exchange and what Dr. Morna Hooker has more recently called interchange in Christ. Distinguish these four moments in the mystery. First, the incarnation when the Son of God came into the human situation becoming man. Second, the cross, where Christ for us, as our representative substitute, bore all that we deserved for our sin 
in the way of divine judgment. But now the third moment in the interchange comes when through faith and God's gift of the Spirit, we become the righteousness of God in union with Christ and in solidarity with him. And here you will see, I'm echoing Romans 6 and Colossians 2, we in solidarity with him die painlessly and invisibly because he died painfully and publicly for us in substitution on the cross. We are united with him in his death and united with him in his resurrection. And it's thus, not otherwise, that his righteousness becomes ours and the effect of his atoning death becomes our pardon and uh, the ground of our acceptance with God. We become the righteousness of God, not apart from him, but in him, on the basis of solidarity. And the fourth point that I must make, the source of substitution is divine love. So often it has been argued by critics of this doctrine that it divides the Trinity by representing a kindly son placating a fierce and hostile father in order to make him love men which he did not do before. That's a travesty. And that is utterly contrary to the scripture witness to this mystery which again and again roots everything in the love of God as the originating source of the atonement of Christ. God is love, says John, 1 John chapter 4, verse 8. And then he goes on to explain his meaning. Not in the way in which modern liberals sometimes explain the theme of divine love, in terms of God being too kindly disposed towards his creatures, finally to judge or banish any of them from his presence, or finally to take any account of them from them of their sin at all, but rather John explains the meaning of the love of God like this, herein is love, not that we loved God, but in a situation where we didn't, that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Love, to be sure, is that which sent the Lord Jesus Christ to the cross, but it was the Father's love, just as it was his own. The source of substitution is the love of the Father and the Son, and we may surely add the Spirit the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are together in the work of atonement wrought on the cross. And the final point which we have to make, I'm having to foreshorten my points a little. You can see I'm making them sketchily now because I'm overrunning time. The final point I have to make is simply this, that the fruit of substitution is the salvation, precisely the salvation, which Paul describes in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 30, where having declared that we preach Christ crucified and understand the gospel in these terms, he goes on to spell out his meaning by saying, verse 30, God is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made to be our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, and our redemption. Wisdom in the sense of the one who makes us wise with that wisdom which leads us into salvation. Righteousness in the sense of his being the one who renders us righteous in God's sight. Redemption in the sense that he is the one in whom we have redemption, sanctification in the basic sense that he is the one who brings us into a covenant relationship with God, committed to God from the human side, but yes, yes, but more important, accepted by God from the divine side in virtue of atonement made. 
That's the fundamental meaning of sanctification in scripture. Sanctification is 